Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome here, and uh, we just are grateful for opportunities to worship God and together as a group, and be thankful, too, for the ministry of Pastor Dave and Jelaine and Josiah and Darius and the girls earlier on, and we just are so thankful for them, and we want to celebrate Jesus today, and so we'll open with Psalms. 34 verses 1 to 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I want us all to stand and I have a favorite I think for the kids today. And it talks about good news and rescuer. And uh, I know we have a lot of bad news in our world today. But no matter what news we hear, we have good news in Christ Jesus. And let's sing about that now. So if you can stand up and sing with us. And if I can hear the haze from, the, from the everybody who would feel free enough to praise the Lord in that, that would be awesome. There is good news for the captive, good news for the shamed. There is good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the doubter, the one who legend failed. For the good Lord has come to seek and save. He's a rescuer. Hey. He's our rescuer. Hey, we are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound! Oh, how grace abounds! We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. He is beauty for the blind man, riches for the poor. He is friendship for the one the world ignores. He is pasture for the weary, rest for those who strive. Oh, the good Lord is the way, the truth, the life. Yes, the good Lord is the way, the truth, the life. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how grace abounds. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. So come and be shameless. Come and be fearless. Come to the foot of Calvary there is redemption for every affliction here at the foot of Calvary so come and be chainless come and be fearless come to the foot of Calvary there is redemption for every affliction here at the foot of Calvary. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how grace abounds. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. Lord, we just thank you again for this day. Thank you that you are our rescuer. And thank you 
that you provided sal salvation for each one of us, and uh, it's your precious blood on the, Christ, on the cross. And Lord, we just thank you for that. Thank you that we can worship together, and I uh, just pray that you'd be with us the rest of the service. Uh, help us to glorify you in, in just a most pleasing way. In Jesus' name, amen. verses 5 through 8 says, Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock and my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Jesus blood and right 
righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the darkness seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When He shall come with trumpet sound, Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. Hebrews 6, verses 19 to 20 says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live there in the 
ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of christ No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he turns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand thank you for your singing please be seated Going into a time of prayer and offering now, so ushers, you can get ready. But I thought I'd come down here, kind of be a little casual today, because as a family today, it's stinging a bit, eh? Don't you think? There's a bit of a sting in the air? Because yeah, it's never good, or it's not, no, stop me there. It's always good to see someone move on, but it's always tough to see them move on. Does that make sense? We'll go with it. But today is a day that we say goodbye to the Tonners as our pastors. And we wanted to, uh, we'll have something later, uh, going fellowship over supper or lunch. But now is the time that we come as a family and we take that breath as we've been talking about these last few weeks and we say, okay. Family goes on. People come, people go. So I thought I would open it up to us today. What's on your heart? Is there something that we need to pray for specifically today that we can do that? Do you want to praise, jump up and down and say, Hallelujah, God is good. Anybody want to share this morning? Phil. Phil. Absolutely. It was so it was amazing to see you and your family walking up and say, Oh, that's that's great. So thank you for being here and for sharing that. And you know, that's the ebb and flow of church life, isn't it? People come, they grow, they get commissioned to go somewhere else. That's an exciting thing. We never have to be sad for that. What else can we pray for? Celebrate today. Yes. Hi. I'm Marilyn. It is, and let's keep that up, right? Dave was a pivotal part of it, but that, he's not the only part. We can keep doing that. God can keep working through us like that. So let's do it. Anything else that anyone wants to say just quickly? Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Amen. You're welcome. Thanks for being with us, part of us. Well, then let's bow before our Lord. Father God, we come today as your body of believers in Kilm and Forestburg, Flagstaff County, from Edmonton, from around the world, Lord, we come to this morning and we join our hearts to ask you to continue to bless us. Lord, we freely confess that you are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the one that we come to serve. You are the one that has grown Sometimes, Lord, you've had to prune us. You've had to say, no, this is not good. This is not my way. But, Lord, we are your church, and we just want to humbly say that we want to continue to be that. As we commission Dave and Jelaine and the boys to their next great adventure, we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would clearly help us to see our next adventure not be bound in what was or even what is, but what you want it to be. Lord, we celebrate the miracles that you've done in our church, the healing of bodies, the healing of hearts, the healing of souls. We thank you for the good reports that are out there, even today, Lord, about eyesight being restored, pain being relieved. Lord, we could praise you all day, for you are good, God, and you are working every moment of every day. So, Lord, we come today and we say thank you. We open ourselves to you, Lord, for your guidance, maybe some discipline, much encouragement, much love, Lord, as we enter this season of celebration of Jesus coming to earth. Lord, let us be in awe that you would choose to do that. Give up glory to come to save us. So, Lord, as we return this this amount of money to you that we say, Lord, thank you for your blessing. May you take this money, Lord, and use it for the furtherance of your kingdom. May it bless people, Lord. May you be honored and glorified through it. As your body, Lord, we say thank you, and we pray all these things to your glory and in your name. Amen.
join us. So just a few announcements this morning before we get started. Uh, there's a potluck today after a service, so if you're able and willing to help with setup for that with tables and chairs, feel free to come downstairs and help set up with that. Uh, for the guys, there's men's breakfast on Saturday at 7.30 in the morning here at the church in Killam, so feel free to come on out to that. There'll be some good food here. And there's, for those of you that like meetings, there's a special congregational meeting next Sunday after church. And if a special meeting is not enough, there's a specialer meeting after that meeting. <laughs> For the brief, for, it's a brief meeting for the KBC workers and helpers, so if you want to come to that special meeting, you can come to that one too. And as well as that, there's some last minute tickets available for the church banquet uh, on, the, yeah, on the 10th in Forsberg. Thank you for the slide. <laughs> so if you still need a ticket for that, talk to Marilyn. She has all the tickets now because I just couldn't sell any. I sold one, so she has them all now. So <laughs> yeah, I sold one. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> So that's what it for announcements, and I'll invite Pastor Dave up. Good morning. Good morning. I just thought of a cruel, or I was thinking of a cruel trick to pay on Miguel this morning, but... I thought, you know, I should have called him up first thing this morning. He says, Miguel, I tested positive for COVID. you got to preach. <laughs> but then I thought even worse, uh, tr right now tell him that, saying, I'm just going to throw up. you got to go preach for 45 minutes, Miguel, just to see how you would react. <laughs> preach, pray, or die any time. Good morning. Kids, you can be dismissed for KBC and teachers. Sorry about that. The pulpit seems like it's off kilter. <laughs> well, maybe it's just me. Probably is me. So in lead up to this, my last sermon as officially your pastor, uh, I had a few people ask me, so are you going to give it to them with both barrels this week, pastor? Like, what can they do, fire you? I, the picture is all I got. I don't have any guns, so, uh, but if I brought a gun, then that would make, make, get people nervous. Rest assured, I'm not going to kind of give it to you this morning. Then I thought, well, I'll just continue on the sermon series or the sermon schedule that Pastor Miguel and I plot out in September. And when I looked in September on my computer, it said that today was the first Sunday of Advent. So I would preach on a topic called hope, which is traditionally the first Sunday of Advent theme. When I looked this week, apparently next week is the first Sunday of Advent. Probably a sign that you should get a new pastor because he's losing it. Then I thought, well, I'll preach what I was in the first sermon to you. And if you want to know the text of my first sermon, ask Sybil because she's remembered all these years. Romans 8, chapter 8, verses 18 to 25. And I candidate it, or I preached that when I candidate with you on September 25th, 2011. 4,445 days ago. I came here in my 40s. I'm going to leave when I'm 60. It's just nice to sound like I've been here for three decades, but it's only 13 years. Just so you know, in this time, I've not regretted a moment of it. I knew God wanted us to come, and we have loved, and I have loved, and the privilege of being your pastor. And I'll cherish every 
of these 4,445 days that I had the privilege of being your pastor for how many days God gives me on this earth until he calls me home. But as I read this first sermon that I preached to you, I decided not to do it for a number of reasons. Well, it's pretty fluffy, actually. I'm surprised you hired me. It was fairly short. And even though it's based on truth, because God's word is constant and true, I think preaching this last sermon, once again, would point me, at the foremost, but also us, towards the past. And not necessarily towards the present, and definitely not towards the future. Where I believe, as believers of Jesus Christ, ours and my focus should be on. Not just on this day where a pastor delivers us that last sermon in a church, but every day. Nevertheless, how often do I, do we want to focus on what has been? Rather than what is, what could be, and what is to be. With saying this, don't hear me wrong, to look and be aware of the past is a good thing for us to do. Because it helps us to understand where we came from. It helps us to understand why things are the way they are and why we are the way we are. And certainly looking at the past allows us to celebrate what God has done over the years. Not just in one pastor's 13 years of ministry, not just in one Christian life, and not just in one church's history, but to look back and realize that he has been, as he says he will be, faithful. When it comes to a local church, he's promised to build a local church. Has he not done that for over 100 years here? Yet, because God is faithful, we need to remember that this Jesus that God has revealed to us, who has saved us, who is sanctifying us, who is keeping us, who can, continues to give us mercy, is the same Christ yesterday, as he was yesterday, as he is today, as he is tomorrow, as Hebrews 13.8 says, because this Jesus that we celebrate and should celebrate weekly and as Christmas season approach, it's not just someone or something of the past. Because he's still at work. He's still at work in us, in this church, and in this world. And he'll remain constantly at work until he comes again. And what's he at work doing? Ultimately, is to bring glory to God, but just the hell he does that is to seek and save the lost. So why he's given us the Great Commission, so as his body, we go ahead and fulfill what Jesus did here. Making disciples as we spread the gospel. To endeavor to reach people of this time with the life-saving message of the gospel, something that I hope we are understanding in deeper and deeper ways, We are to do, as a Christian, as a pastor, as a church, not by looking in the past. Because if we do, it presents huge problems that do lead to major implications and consequences. Not in terms of the loss, not hearing the good news of the gospel that we've been given to share, but it presents huge problems to us as individuals and as the body of Christ because if all we're doing is looking in the past, the majority of time, wanting things to stay the way that they are, wanting things to kind of be one, how they once were, and so forth, first complacency sets in. At least I find that. And then after complacency sets in, apathy. Which then makes it very hard for us to do what we've been called to do as a body, because we don't really want to. I'm 60 now. I'm gonna, I've whined about that. And I'll keep whining until I'm 61. Then I'll whine about being 61. And one of the reasons I don't like being 60 is I don't sleep as long anymore. Because I don't want to sleep as long. Because if I sleep long, you know how I wake up? 
<clears throat> my dad, my wife says, you remind me of my, your dad. <laughs> now I know why my dad was very stiff. Does anybody have that problem? When you lay still long enough, you just get stiff. I think a lot of believers, a lot of churches are stiff because they spend way much too much time looking at the past than looking forward and, and the present. Because as a body, one part of the work we've been left to do is to do what Jesus did, which was to seek and save the lost. Here's something I read from one blogger this week. You can't move forward if you're always looking back. You can't move forward unless you're always looking back. And if you try, you're going to run into something. Going on, this blogger explains some of the reasons why, I think it was a female, that she is, there, says there's such an attraction to us to focus on the past. And my finding personally, this attraction to the past gets worse as I get older. She says, we are creatures of nostalgia. We feel good when we remember giddy moments from the past, like the smell of mom's favorite dish, simmering it in the oven as a child. Or perhaps those distant memories when you sprawled out on the couch on a Saturday on a warm, sunny day, watching your reruns of your favorite cartoon without a care in the world. We like to look back into the past because it feels familiar. Like putting on an oversized sweatshirt that always provides you with comfort. I think this blogger gets to the heart of why the past seems so desirable. You know why? It's comfortable. It's carefree. It's safe. Because we generally forget the bad of the past and only remember the good. Oh, and the past is predictable. See, looking forward towards the past involves little or no risk. Now, for a Christian, to live a life without risk, is any faith required? To live a life without risk, is any faith really required? So question, where would God want us to put our focus towards? The past, the present, or the future? Now, I share this with you because this has been a very personal question I've been battling with inside myself for a number of years which is probably part of the answer why my future is to be the way it is going to be. Two passages, which are ones I thought I would share in my first week of Advent sermon with you, are ones that I think actually contrast the idea of looking forward or looking back and the implications that come as a result. The first one is Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 to 17. It speaks of King Ahaz. The second one is Luke chapter 2, 22 to 32, and it speaks of Simeon. If you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 to 17, because I think these passages and the narratives around the men in these passages helps us understand as one look towards the present, or the past, without considering the past, the present, and the future, and how one didn't, and the consequences and implications that came out. If you have your Bibles, let's read Isaiah chapter 7 together. You can follow along in there if your eyes are good enough. Again, verse 10, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask for a sign of the Lord your God, let it be deep as shoal and as, or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. But for before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring, you, bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's hell such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the, the king of Assyria. 
In this passage, God's prophet Isaiah is speaking to King Ahaz, who was the 11th king of the southern kingdom of Judah. So it's telling us that the, uh, Israel had divided, and there was, now there's two kingdoms, Israel to the north, Judah to the south, meaning then it's before the exile as well. And in this passage, we hear that the great fear was upon this king. Great fear because, according to verse 16, he was dreading the two kings who ruled over two different lands. These lands, we find out from verse 1 of chapter 7, was the land of Israel to the north and Syria to the east. Apparently, these kings had formed an alliance, and the sole one of the purposes of this alliance was to see King Ahaz disposed of as king of Judah so they can install their own king. Meaning then that this time that Ahaz was living in was a good time of great uncertainty with great pressure. Has anybody ever lived in a time of uncertainty and great pressure? I'm surprised my wife hasn't raised her hand. 29 years of marriage, that's pretty much describes her marriage. <laughs> we are right now. You know, one thing I find about the pastor is that how, one way I handle it is my focus wants to go to the past. My focus wants to go where it's safe and where it's predictable and where it's comfortable and so on. Because the future I don't know about, and the future is certainly times of uncertainty, seems dangerous, seems a kerfuffle, and so on. Here's the thing for a believer in God, one of the most often promise, uh, promises of Scripture is that he'll be with us. We heard in the Great Commission, therefore, as King Ahaz faced his future of uncertainty, he knew if he took up God on his amazing offer that God was going to be with him. An amazing offer is quite amazing, really, that through his prophet Ahaz, or through his prophet Isaiah, Ahaz was told by God to ask for a sign. Don't think of this as a genie showing up, and I'll, I'll give you three wishes, Ahaz. Look what God says as a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol, so hell, and as high as heaven. In other words, ask for a miracle. Ahaz, try me out as God and see what I can do. Unfortunately, from 2 Kings 16, verses 2 to 4, Ahaz's faith was non-existent. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem and did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God as his father David has done. But he walked in the way of the king of Israel. In other words, you're just worse. You're just like the northern kingdom. He even burnt his son as an offering. This king offered up one of his kids to a pagan god. According to the spectral practice of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel, and he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. This king had very low if he had any faith at all. Yet what does the God of the universe ask this king to do? Trust in me. Trust in me and have faith in me. Because he wanted to see this king have greater faith. And by the way, for us who are people of faith, isn't God always asking us to increase our faith by trusting in him more? So when God has shown up in our lives, when he does, how have we, how will we respond? When we look at Ahaz, we see that his first response sounds quite spiritual, even mature. I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. It's even scriptural. He responded with scripture. Nevertheless, just because someone sounds pious, because someone knows scripture, someone sounds deep and mature, 
doesn't necessarily mean that their heart has the same depth that their mouth is trying to communicate. Which is the case with Ahaz here, since as the remainder of this passage reveals, Ahaz Pius' talk, all his talk, were just words that lacked any depth. Because in his heart, he really lacked any faith in Yahweh. He lacked faith to see a different future than the one his flesh feared. Which is why even with his great talk, even with the great offer that God gave him, any sign, just tell me. Like, if I was there, it's like, hey, God, could you wipe out these kingdoms and anybody else who wants to get rid of me? That would have been a start for a miracle. But he didn't ask God for a sign. He didn't walk in faith. Actually, history tells us that this king who didn't want to test God trusted more in himself. Trusted his own self-sufficiency. Trusted in his own affluence. Trusted in probably what he did before. Therefore, he reached out to the mighty nation of Assyria for his deliverance. Rather than trusting in God. Oh, the God who just basically showed up and offered him the world. God knows the true intent of any heart. Therefore, he knew what Ahaz was up to here. Nevertheless, God decided to show Ahaz, decided to show all of Judah, that's the house of David, really everyone, even us here today, a mighty sign. Verse 13 of chapter 7. Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose good, the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon the people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. In giving Ahaz the sign, God dropped probably the biggest bombshell that he could, saying that the Lord himself would give the house of David a sign that would be none like any other sign that has ever been given. Of course, this is the prophecy, prophecy concerning Emmanuel. Of course, the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy is why we begin to celebrate Advent next week. Because Advent prepares us to celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who, Matthew 1, verses 18 to 25, and Luke chapter 1, verses 31 to 35, says, is God with us that he is Emmanuel? Telling us that Jesus is not only the perfect Savior that because he is God, but because Jesus being the only Savior, is, he is from God. Therefore, if you want to serve you right with God, put your trust in Jesus. Because he didn't just come as a babe at Christmas time, did he? But at Easter, he hung on the cross as the sacrificial lamb of God who hung on the cross to pay the penalty that our sin deserves. Let me just plead with you one last time that this church stuff is not just religion. It's talking about Jesus. We talk about Jesus for a reason, to trust in him so you can see eternity with the rest of the believers. Put your trust in Jesus. This is why this was such a glorious sign that God shared with, uh, through Isaiah to Ahaz in the house of David. However, this sign that Isaiah spoke of had an immediate significance to Ahaz as well. Remember back to my Bible school days, they talked about some biblical prophecies are like skipping stones on water, where every time the rock skips, there's significance in that era. Right away, there's significance with this sign, because when this sign is given through Isaiah, there was a woman at that time of the prophecy was a virgin, but yet would become married. She would conceive and bear a son whose name would be called Emmanuel. Some scholars suggest that this is Isaiah's own son. Therefore, this sign, Emmanuel, in that context, served as a reminder 
that God was with his people and that he would care for them. Remember that often repeated promise that's found throughout Scripture? Anybody know when an Orthodox Jewish boy is considered a man? Age 12. Age 12, they are fully to expect to know the difference between good and evil and choose accordingly. Therefore, this sign that was given meant that in 12 years' time, Syria and, a, and the northern kingdom would be out of the picture. History tells us this is exactly what happened. As Isaiah delivered this prophecy around 734 B.C., in 732 B.C., two years later, Assyria defeated, Assyria defeated Syria. And in 722 B.C., Assyria invaded the northern kingdom of Israel, thus fulfilling this prophecy. Isn't it great that God's word is true? That we have fulfilled prophecy, therefore the promises we're still waiting on, we know will come true. Well, not just then, but even too true today in our lives. Now, one might think with Assyria doing this, with taking out Syria and Assyria taking out Israel, hey, Ahaz was wise. You know, he trusted himself. He did his normal thing. He trusted in his self-sufficiency. It turned out pretty good for him. The trouble is, he was just looking in the past and not the present or future, what God was going to do. Because in verse 17, with this great sign was also judgment. Judah herself would eventually be overtaken by Assyria, and history tells us this is exactly what happened in 701 B.C. A lot of times when we look back, we create idols. And usually when we start doing idol worship, the idol ends up overcoming us, as the case here with Ahaz and Assyria. Moving from Ahaz's example, let us look at the example of Simeon. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to, 20, or 30, 22 to 24 to start with. So 700 years later, the prophecy has been fulfilled. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male from the, who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons." context of this passage, the baby Jesus had been born about 40 days. As required by Jewish law, his parents, earthly parents, Joseph and Mary, needed to bring him to the temple and to present him to God because Jesus was their firstborn child. And according to Leviticus chapter 12, Mary's purification had to have an offering presented for her, so that's what they're doing as well. We also should note that the offering was for poor people that they gave that's how poor Jesus' family was. But nevertheless, just at the moment that they're doing this, getting away to God, the range of things, a devout and righteous Jewish man named Simeon was there at the temple. He, we know he was Jewish because only Jews were allowed in the temple. And Simeon was no ordinary man, as he was a man who had been awaiting the Savior's birth. Because it was revealed to him by the Spirit that he would see the Savior's see the Savior in his lifetime. Verse 25, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. The consolation of Israel was a rabbinic term saying that the Messiah had been, the start of the Messiah, that time would be when the Messiah was born. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. Now, could you imagine if you were Simeon and it had been revealed to you that you were going to see the Messiah? You were going to see the Emmanuel that Isaiah 7 promised. I can imagine how I would act. That not only would I be looking ahead each and every day of my life for the Savior's coming, like, is today today? Is today today? Is today today? I would also be looking back 
at Scripture, at teachings, in order to understand as fully as I could who the Savior was really to be, what the Savior was to do, how the Savior would come forth, and so on. In other words, I would be trying to deepen my faith, which is probably why Simeon is described as the developed person. He's been promised something that God would deliver on, so he wanted to have his faith mature so that one day when he met the Savior, things would match up pretty good. And then that day comes. Can you imagine what Simeon must have felt like? You finally beheld him you were waiting for. How would you react? I think we get some sort of sense of what Simeon felt like through his own words of verse 28 to 32. He, looked, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Now in these words of Simeon, I think we need to note something profound. Because as compared to King Ahaz, and probably as a result of the level of faith that Simeon had versus Ahaz, Simeon's focus was just not on the past. Once his faith became his sight, he easily could have just begun focus on nothing else except, hey, he's here, I'm done. What I hope for has come to be Let's go. That's not the case. His response wasn't totally, take me home, Lord, I've seen your son. It was there. But his focus became on the present and on the future. Towards the present, since literally the salvation the Lord had promised had now come, and Simeon understood what was going on, what the sal- that salvation meant, it wasn't just for him that this salvation was going to go among the people and live with them. That there was a chance for people to come to faith. Be free of their sin. And his focus was towards the future and on what God would do through this Messiah. Because in the future, the Messiah wasn't just going to be for the Jews. They're going to be for the Gentiles too. Meaning this Messiah was to be for all people. Hallelujah. If you're a Gentile, you should be raising your hands saying, praise God. If you don't know what a Jew and Gentile is, Miguel will give you an inspection later on. Because he apparently just talked about it in men's group. At least for the male side. Are you turning red? (laughs) Shucks. This is why when Simeon picks up this baby Jesus in his arms, is praising God. And not just what God had done in the past or promised to do in the past about Simeon seeing Jesus, but Simeon praised God for what this child was to do in the present and would do in the future, which I think he was more excited about. Because he understood, hey, I got to see it. I want other people to experience him. What gets us excited? As believers of Christ, as Killam Baptist Church, as a pastor, what God has done in the past or what God is doing in the present and what God will do in the future. Is our faith like King Ahaz or is our faith like Simeon's? Here's the thing, I'll be honest, we'll never see God do anything new if we never turn our focus towards the present and towards the future. It doesn't mean that he hasn't worked in the past. It just means if we want to see something new, we have to be looking somewhere else. That requires risk. That requires stepping into the future that he has purpose for us as individuals, as a body, and as a pastor. Are we living with the full knowledge that he's still at work? 
you know God's still at work in this world, right? He wasn't just at work on December 6, 1987 when I was saved. I've seen him at work in 13 years of being your pastor. I have had front row seats at how he's working. And I think every Christian should have those front row seats, by the way, if we're stepping into where God is at work already. Here's something else as I close. Even though we may want to focus on the past, we can never go back on that past we focus so much on. And frankly, why we then can so easily turn the past into an idol. Since we spend more and more energy trying to recreate the past to the point it consumes us and causes us to forget that God wants to serve him where he's working, which is not in the past. He's working in the present and as he will work in the future. That was us 13 years ago and one month ago. There is nothing I'd love to do than go back and have hair again. <laughs> to nothing to go back to have my kids that age again. Because at that age, everything was a lot more safer, a lot more comfortable, a lot less risk taking than letting them go where they're at now. I'd love to go back and enjoy what I enjoyed back then. I'd love to go back and have what we had back then. I'd love to go back and relive what I've relived over these, thir or lived over these 13 years. But the simple and hard truth for the pastor who's 60 years old is I can't. I can't make my kids small again. I guess I can pay money and get a wig. But everybody knows it's a wig. Just like none of you can. See, what I can do is a step into the future. What we can do is step into the future knowing that he's still at work in this world. Is he not? And enjoy the future that he has purposed for us. Explore it, discover it, have excitement over it like Simeon. Is today the day? But you know why we don't? It requires risk. Because most likely, not most likely, yes, we'll have to change. Because the future is different than the past. But isn't it worth it to see God do something amazing and profoundly new? to see how the promise that he gave Ahaz is working out, the promise that Simeon worshipped God over, how it's working out in this world where people are still coming to Jesus and leaving their sins behind. Here's a quote from author James Sherman. Originally, they said that C.S. Lewis was this quote, but in fact checked it. It's from an unknown author named James Sherman, but he says this, you can't go back and change with the beginning because some of us say, oh, I can't go back if I could only, I, I live in regret. Well, that's a ploy of the enemy to park it. The enemy doesn't want us to live in the future. He wants us to live in the past. God wants us to live in the present and into the future until we see him face to face. Therefore, my friends, may we both step forward into the future that God has purposely purpose for both of us to go for there'll be different paths from here on till we hit eternity but as we do let us experience him in amazing ways and see him do amazing things through us for the sake of his name and his kingdom let's pray heavenly father we thank you lord god that our future is secure because we'll sing hallelujah to the throne for all of eternity. Lord God, let us forsake all the things that cling to us and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. 
in order to run it, not to just run it, but run, run it to win it for your sake of your kingdom and for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like the worship team to come up. Please stand with us as we sing. Come, thou long expected Jesus, as we look forward to our Christmas season. I think we have a very special little sermon service going to start right now with some kids coming up. So please come. So a year and a half ago, Mrs. Tonner started the Killam, or the, Ki the Kids Bible College here in Killam. She took the program and she adapted it to fit our special circumstances. She, and, it, and, and believe me, there was a little bit of blood, sweat, and maybe some tears. <laughs> but it has been wonderful. The goal of it was to be done through the Bible in three years. And last week, I heard Bonnie say in her class, look where we are. We're halfway, we're at the bottom of the circle. We're halfway through. It's been great. So we couldn't let Mrs. Tonner go without giving her a little something special. So Jelaine, if you would come up. This is from the kids to hang in your new home. Oh, and don't you dare do this to me. <laughs> uh, I know, well, I've been not thinking about it. Um, because of this program, I found a very special friend in this lady, and I'm going to miss her very much. But uh, thank you for blessing us so much with your 
love of Jesus and your love of children and your love for us. And uh, we wish you all the best in your new endeavors, and we hope that the Peace River Church discovers your love of music and children. Thank you, kids. Thank you, Lori. I believe uh, we have something else, else from the ladies. Katie, would you come, please? Can you come back up for a second? <laughs> Not only have you served the, the children, but you've served the ladies really well, too. You've been such a good friend and a, a good servant-hearted woman and a good example for me and many of um, the rest of us. And we've just loved and enjoyed. I've only been here for a fraction of the time that you've been here, and I've seen you give your heart to so many people and serve so many people, and we're really going to miss you. So it's a lovely little something to say thank you. We love you. <laughs> then because you know that's not fair do it to me twice and you know you know I'm a goner so it would be unfair of me to not um, reply to your gracious gifts but it isn't the gifts it's the people it's the kids it's you guys and it's the fact that this isn't really goodbye it's see you later and that we get to spend eternity together and you guys have been a bigger blessing than gifts. You guys have blessed us more than we have blessed you. I am positive of that. And it would be wrong of me to not acknowledge that, just because I might cry. And every single one of you, from the babies to my older friends, <laughs> Every single one has been a huge blessing to our family. Thanks, Jolene. I know you can all smell the food, but a few more things that we need to, we must process here. Josiah, Darius, come on up. You're in the next contestant. Uh -huh. I try not to pick on kids that are younger and tougher than me, but uh, this time I'm going to. Yeah. So men, I've certainly appreciated, you know, your friendship for, to Riley and uh, playing with you. Uh, worship team has been great, so keep that up. We didn't figure it's fair that they get all the glory, right? Because you actually keep the household together, right? <laughs> so this is just a, uh, we'll miss you, but uh, we know you'll be back. You can stop in on your way to Miller next year, right? So this will be a good thing. So that's for you, my young friend. And they'll be up later, so don't worry. And this is Darius. Wait, there's, there's some extra writing on this envelope. It says, happy birthday. What? It's birthday? You know what we have to do now. All right, all together. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Darius. Happy birthday to you. And many more. Thank you, boys. We are also today, it's just full of blessing, isn't it? We also have today our district coach, our dear friend and pastor Dennis Gully with us and he's going to say a few words and then uh, we'll, we'll get some tissues out I think maybe so come pastor share with us please well good morning everybody uh, great to be with you on this sad and yet joyous occasion and uh, 
I, I'm, try, I'm going to try not to say what I said down in Forestburg. There's lots to be said for, for these wonderful people before us. Um, first of all, I have to say I've never had a real problem with, with David. But he said something in Forestburg that I had a problem with. I thought maybe he didn't mean to say it, so I listened again today, and he, he said it again in the second sermon here. But he seems to have a, the thought that l the loss of hair is a sign of weakness, uh, and uh, I, don't, I don't agree with that. Uh, but David has been my guide in life because he's about three or four months older than me uh, in that 60 uh, age group. But it has been such a joy to get to know uh, the Tonner family and to get to know you as a church uh, with them as your pastor and family. When I was asked, uh, when I applied for my position, I began immediately to look up the churches of the BGCA and to pray over those churches even before I got hired. The one connection I had in all those churches was with the Killam because I had been out here about 20 years ago and spoke at a youth rally. So this is the one that kind of got my heart, you know, and the one said, I know that church, I can pray for that church, but I didn't know this pastor. But this is a passage of scripture I want to share with you that truly was my heart from the beginning and my heart for David and for Jelaine, for their family, and for you as a church. This is from Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. While I feel that for the church, I really feel that for you as pastor and family. And this last part is for both the church and particularly you, Tonner family. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We know that while your work here might be wrapping up, your work for God and his kingdom is not wrapping up. And we rejoice with you as you go. I want to thank you for the work that you've done here. And I want you to know as a church that there was not a time where David was not in a group of pastors where he wasn't appreciated and respected. But more importantly, not a time when he was with a group of pastors and other leaders from our district or the denomination as a whole where David didn't speak words of hope for this church, where David didn't speak his vision or what he believed God's vision was for the future of this church. His very sermon today on the future was the way he lived his life. Hard times, good times, struggles, joys, it didn't matter. David was always looking forward, always trying to figure out what God wanted. I picked up this task in the middle of COVID, and David was trying to figure out COVID and trying to figure out new ways of shepherding and caring. But David and Jelaine, Josiah and Darius, I just want to say thank you for allowing yourselves to be used as a family to affect the spiritual life of this community, this church, Forestburg, Flagstaff County. You have been amazing shepherds. And I know God will continue to bless many people through you. We will miss you. And I bring greetings from all your fellow pastors and leaders and from our denominational leaders. You will be greatly missed. But we are thankful for the time we had to journey with you. Thank you. It's time. Please come up. You're not coming up, Jelaine. Yes, please. We're way past that. Three years ago, I came across a quote. It was from 1577, Sir Francis Drake. Francis Drake circumnavigated the globe. He helped repulse the Spaniards when they tried to attack England, and he was a believer. Three years ago, and guess what popped up on my Facebook memories this morning? It was this poem. God's tapestry is never-ending. It's amazing what he brings. And, I th and as I sat and listened to Dave in Forsberg, I had to share it with people. And I think this is your heart from from me to you and to you to us, is this. Disturb us, Lord, is the name of the poem. And it says, we, When we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little, when we arrive safely because we sailed too close to the shore, 
Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Excuse me. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. And in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas when storms, where storms show your mastery, where losing sight of land we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back to the horizon of our hopes and to push us into the future in strength, courage, love, and hope. This we ask in the name of our captain, who is Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray for you. My fellow deacons, if you would come up. And I would also invite anyone who wants to lay hands on this fine couple so that we can commission them to the next glorious unfolding that the Lord Jesus Christ has for them. Come. It's already been said that this is not the end, it's the beginning. It's not goodbye, this is just see you later. They are going forward to a new venture. They have been refreshed, renewed, rejuvenated to go. It's a good thing. Eh, it's a sad thing. Emotions are good. I agree. So... Let's pray together. If you want to stand, if you want to hold out your hands, whatever you want to do as we commission this couple. Lord God, we pause in this moment of eternity and we say thank you. We thank you for 13 years. We thank you for a couple that has grown, that has learned, that has taught, that has stumbled at times, but you've picked them up, Lord. You've used them. You've blessed them. Oh, Father, we can just go on and on about how you are good and that you have shown your mercy upon Dave and Jelaine. Lord, we celebrate. What an awesome new opportunity, new ways to share your faith, to share your glory. As you say goodbye to these, this couple, our under-shepherd, we praise you. We ask you you would go with them. We know you do. We pray your protection upon them, on their marriage, Lord. We pray that you would continue to grow them in their love for one another, that they would look fondly on each other every day and like each other, and that you would continue to grow these two fine young men, Darius and Josiah. They have a A lifetime ahead of them, Lord. We pray that you would allow them to fit in quickly in a new community. That they would remember and stay connected with us and we with them. Lord, that this would be good because you are good, Lord. So bind this family together. Keep them close to your heart, Lord. We know you do. And help us as we continue forward to your kingdom's glory. So Lord, all these things And for the food set before us, we celebrate this banquet that we will eat in celebration. We pray to the name, or in the name of Jesus, and to your infinite glory. And we all said, Amen. This is a token of our deep appreciation, just a token. Nothing can ever provide. But within there, there's a note that we have commissioned Kristen Kieber to make a painting on your behalf that will hang, hopefully, uh, for many years in remembrance of us and of your ministry as a whole, not just us, but thank you. You may say yes. Well, I'm no longer the under-shepherd, so you might (laughs) cut the mic out. (sighs) Now you're going to get me going. As Jelaine says, thank you. 13 years. You gave me the privilege of being your under shepherd. To walk with some of your relatives in their last days. To stand at the front of the casket. To hold and dedicate your children. 
to marry your kin, to pray with you, to help you through sickness. And as Jelaine said, you have blessed me more than I feel I've ever been a blessing to any of you. Uh, you gave me the opportunity to be, like I said, a front row spectator to what God is doing. So thank you. 13 years has gone by fast, and I don't believe in reincarnation, but if I could do it again, not only would I want hair, I'd want 13 more <laughs> years. Sorry, Dennis. <laughs> and Greg and Jason. Oh, man, I just offended a lot of people. <laughs> As Jelaine also said, that's why she should have been preaching all these years. <laughs> this is not goodbye. It's just until we're there. And we'll look back and whatever God does for us in the future, we know that part of the reason why is that we have such a firm foundation that Killam Baptist Church help us to establish in him. So to him be the glory today. It's not about my 13 years. It's all about him. And whatever years we all have left, it's all about him. Remember that. And remember that we'll count you as friend always and look fondly back at this time here. So God bless. That's it. Get out. <laughs> Let's go uh, partake together downstairs. Um, you are dismissed. Guys, if we can just zip down and set up some tables, that'd be great.